first couple properties that I bought so those first few years, uh, I, I always thought, well, I need to keep working my job to make enough money for down payments mm -hmm. to, to buy more properties. Then I learned the the Burr method and I learned that I could put my capital into a property and improve it and refinance and do it again and re keep reuse, reusing the same capital. Are you looking to achieve massive success in your life without dealing with costly investment nightmares? If yes, then this is the podcast for you. Here, we provide engineers and busy professionals all the secrets and strategies to create multiple streams of income, build generational wealth, and live a meaningful life by design. Here's your host, Ted Patel. Welcome, Decoding Cashflow listeners. Uh, today, we have Kyle McCorkle on our show. Kyle is an industrial engineer turned buy and hold investor, wholesaler, house flipper, and a realtor. He's also founder of Safe Home Offer. He started investing in 2015 and has about eight year experience buying and renovating houses. Uh, Kyle has been able to forge a strategic partnership with his contractor, which allows him to focus on marketing, deal flows and financing side of the business. Kyle, welcome to the show. Uh, you want anything to be added to your introduction? That all sounds good. Thanks for having me, Tab. All right. Uh, nice to have you too, Kyle. All right. Uh, so Kyle, uh, to get started, right? Uh, let's, if you can give a de uh, brief explanation, or I would say, if you can provide our listeners your background, what, how did you get started in real estate and what do you do currently? Sure. So um I'm born and raised in Hershey, Pennsylvania. That's where I live right now. Um, that's where I'm talking to you from. Uh, so went to Penn State for industrial engineering um, because my dad told me to. Um, and uh, it actually turned out to be to be to work out really well. Um, so I graduated from Penn State. Uh <clears throat> My wife was also an industrial engineer, so we both got really good jobs out of college. I went into consulting, uh, and I was traveling full time, um, and I was doing that for about ten years. So, uh, two thousand eight until twenty nine, early twenty nineteen, um, I was in consulting and I was traveling Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday, um, pretty much gone, you know, all the time. Um, so got married to my wife and she started uh, talking about having kids. You know, this, this was like 2013, 2014. Um, and uh, so, and I just started thinking like, what is, what is next for me? Because I can't, I can't keep up this lifestyle. It was fun. I was learning a lot. I was making, making really good money. Um, so, but uh, I just started thinking, you know, how can I, how can I make money without working or, you know, cause I, I, I was like, I don't want like an office job. Like I don't, um, I'd love to not travel, you know, but I don't want to just go drive, drive to an office each day. You want so. a flexibility of time, right? In short. Yeah. 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 So, and I, I didn't know, I didn't know what passive income was or, um, I didn't, you know, know what the term, but, but I knew I wanted it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and then I just started thinking about, about right, rental properties seem like they make sense. It seems like you can make some money, like in, intuitively to me, it always made sense. Um, and then I started reading books and listening to podcasts. Um, and then, you know, after a, maybe, maybe about a year of researching heavily, uh, bought my first property in 2015. Um, so, kind of I I have morphed from buying, you know, cash flowing, performing assets from day one. Um, you know, my first couple properties were like that. And then kind of morphed into buying burrs. So the the buy, rehab, refinance, repeat method. Um mm -hmm. and then I, you know, my first couple were single families and then I've you know, scaled up into larger, you know, which to me is three, four, five units. Um, and then I went full time into real estate investing in 2019, started flipping. About a year or two later, I started wholesaling as well. And now I have my realtor's license. So 
Uh, it's just kind of really looking for as many income streams as possible at this point. Um, but okay. really the, uh, the, the number one focus is to build up the rental portfolio, um, to keep chasing that passive income. Awesome, man. Uh, that's great. Uh, you're wearing many hats, you know, realtor, wholesaler, fix and flip, right. buy and hold. Um, so, so, uh, <clears throat> You you mainly focus in which areas, like uh, where you live, surrounding that, or you also or try to invest out state. Uh, so right now it is primarily, um, yeah, pretty much where I live within within about an hour. Um, back you know in the beginning of my investing career, I did buy some properties in Indianapolis. Um, mm -hmm. So those were all just single family turnkey properties through like a turnkey provider. Um, so, uh, but those have, have all been, have all been sold. So on, on this show also, right, many of our listeners, they are like, a, they have the full-time job, yep. right? And uh, some of them, they love their full-time job uh, and want to invest uh, their, you know, earnings into real estate. And some of them might be, you know, uh, all right, I want to transition fully into real estate. Let, let me, you know, actively participate in real estate. What, 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 how, how did you figure out how, what was your step-by-step -step process for transitioning from full-time to, uh, sorry, from nine to five to full-time real estate investor? Right. Yeah. So it, it was a process and I would say, you know, um, it kind of grew organically. Like I didn't really know exactly how it was going to turn out. Um, I knew eventually I wanted, I wanted passive income to replace uh, my income and my wife's income. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, you know, for the first couple properties that I bought, so those first few years, uh, I, I always thought, well, I need to keep working my job to make enough money for down payments mm -hmm. to, to buy more properties. Yeah. Then I learned the, the Burr method and I learned that I could put my capital into a property and improve it and refinance and do it again and re keep reuse, reusing the same capital. And then, I, and then I was like, well, I don't need the job now to save up money for a down payment. All I need is a bunch of capital that I can put into a property and then take back out. What I what I didn't didn't realize at the time is that burrs don't always go as planned. And sometimes you're left with money in the deal. Um <laughs> so uh but anyway, so you know, kind of came to that realization, saw that, you know, my small portfolio at the time of it was probably 10 units. Um mm -hmm. I was making some money and I and I just did the math um, and did the math with my wife, you know, because I feel like through most of this, it was proving to her that, that this can work. Um, so, uh, and what we did is we started, uh, we started living off of just her income. Um, so I just, uh, all the money I was making off consulting, I put into a separate bank account and, and then I switched over to her health insurance and we we basically kind of simulated what it would be like to um, to live off of her income. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that for a couple of years, uh, and we just kind of proved the concept that uh, hey, we can live very com comfortably off of just her income, knowing that whenever I do leave consulting, um, you know, I, it would probably take me a few years to build up the passive income. Um, so, so that seemed to work out pretty well. And then once we were comfortable with that, uh, I basically started not necessarily making demands, but um, letting the consulting company know, um, know, know where I stood. And I said, hey, long term, I don't want to be traveling anymore. I like mm -hmm. this work. Um, so if you can find me remote work or local work, I will gladly keep doing this. Um, and if you can't, then that's that's fine too you know but i i yeah. I, I, I won't be working here anymore i have other options um, yeah yeah so okay, yeah uh so yeah they they found me a lot a lo some local work and i was working near uh near here in in lancaster actually 
Um, and it was great. You know, I was getting paid as a consultant to only drive, you know, 30 minutes. Uh, I was able to come home each day. Um, and then, uh, you know, so yeah, it was towards the end of 2018, I got a call and said, Hey, your current project is wrapping up. Uh, and the, the next one is in Memphis. And I said, no. And they were like, yeah, well, that's what, that's what we thought you would say. So, um, it was very, very clear and very civil, you know, it was very laid out. I mean, I still keep in touch with those guys. I think they're, I think they're great. Um, you know, and, th and that was part, part of, that was pretty much by design as well, because I, I didn't want to burn that bridge. I wanted to be able to go, go back if I ever needed to. Yeah, absolutely. So start out small, right? Uh, the advice is start out small, investing, uh, you know, one by, you know, one, one at a time. It yep. might be a uh, single family, multifamily, but just, uh, just uh, try to learn the game while you're working, you know, try to, really? yeah. yeah. When, once you have a hold over it, then you can think about, you know, if you have enough uh, reserve in your ba bank balance, you can take a chance, just leave the job, start exactly. working full time. If you have, as as you mentioned, you have you had your spouse who was already working. So uh, that worked out pretty well uh, for you during the transition phase. Exactly. So, yep. And uh, so for uh, initially, right, uh, you mentioned one uh, one a sentence where you said the Burr method sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Uh, I think that's mainly because uh, sometimes bank doesn't allow you to pull out all the capital based on, you know, the cash flow, uh, DSCR ratio, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, I would say in my case, it was just simply that the renovations went way, went way over budget, you know? Okay. So if I uh, bought a, uh, I guess to use simple numbers, um, if I bought a property for 300,000, and expected to put a hundred thousand into it and have it be worth five hundred thousand. Um, it would be worth five hundred thousand when when I'm done, but maybe I put one hundred fifty thousand into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so instead of pulling out eighty percent of my money, you know, or pulling out four hundred thousand, um, and that being all all my money, you know, I'm all in for four fifty, and uh, stuck, you know, kind of have fifty thousand dollars stuck in stuck in the deal. So, mm -hmm. um. And that, and, and so that was why that, I, sorry. That, that normally happens, right? In construction project, uh, sometimes- It, it happens all the time. To, yeah. yeah uh, there's, you, very rarely you meet the exact amount that you have budgeted for, right. you know? So we also, you know, always keep 10% additional buffer whenever we want to start the project. And right. uh, slowly and steadily, you know, once you gain more experience, like uh, same for you too. Um, now you know exactly how to, you know, what's gonna cost. It would be some somewhere five to ten percent plus or minus. Right. Uh, yeah. And and at least for me in my area, we have a lot of old buildings, and um, it seems like the the older the buildings, the harder it is to estimate i mean yeah you you, you um, never know what you're gonna unearth when you oh start gosh. opening the walls or it's, floors yeah. it's crazy it's crazy yeah but yeah. Our, our our guys do take very good care of the of the buildings you know and we we feel like once the initial renovations are done then we're not going to be able to or we're not going to have much uh catbacks after that mm -hmm. and uh do you uh with the contractor, right? You, of course, uh, do you have the same contractor working for all the properties or how, 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 how do you work with those contractors? Like, so back in 2019, when I went full time, um, and I, I, my first couple deals in 2019, I was, you know, I was still solo, um, mm -hmm. and trying to kind of do it all myself. So one of the contractors that worked with me, um, was close to my age uh and we just really got along and um he started asking me about invest he said i want to do some investing myself but i don't know how to find deals and um so anything anyways one thing led to another and mm -hmm. you know we weren't looking for partners but then we just said why don't i find the deals and you do the work um yeah. So that's what we've been doing, you know, for about for about four years now. 
Uh, so, so I'm pretty much exclusively focused on marketing and finding deals and finding money. Um, and then once we close on the deal, uh, I get him his keys and, uh, and his scope and he has about 15 guys working for him plus, plus a bunch of subs. Um, and he just handles all of the, uh, renovations. All right. That, that, that's pretty good. Actually, you know, you have someone who is already experienced on your team. You don't have to worry about because uh, he has been working, uh, he might be working as a, a contractor for a while. So he knows, uh, you know, how much labor, how much, uh, how much is the material, he might be able to get a more realistic, I would say, estimate, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, when you mentioned about marketing, you handle the marketing aspect of your business. So what, what are the main funnels that you have created so to bring in the deals to you? Yeah, so it's it's continually changing. Um, and we've had to really kind of scale back the marketing over the past 12 months or so um, because the, the market has just gotten so tight with uh, a lot of sellers who can't or don't want to sell anymore. Um, so, but things that I've done in the past, so I'm still doing a lot of direct mail, um, direct mail in my market. Um, we definitely have a lot of older sellers, so direct mail seems to work really well. Um, I've done, I've had people cold calling for me. Um, I've done, uh, pay-per-click marketing, you know, Google, Google ads, I've done some cold texting. Um, and then I, I actually saw someone working for me. It's a VA from the Philippines. Um, and she's, so we call her like a lead manager, but she's doing other things. You know, she's like going through county records and um, looking up foreclosures and liens and stuff like that and continually building a list, um, which then gets, then gets mailed. She's also answering the phones. Um, so for someone gets a letter, they call and they're going to talk to her first. She gets all the property information, finds out why they're selling, if they have asking price. Um, and then she'll send that person over to me. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, uh, what, what is the normal target audience? So we have a couple different lists that we've done, um, in the past. So, I mean, the, the main two kind of pipelines that I think of are multifamily. So bigger properties with multiple units, um, as big as possible. You know, the, the biggest we've bought is five units, but mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think we're set up to be able to buy much bigger. Um, so we have multifamily owners, uh, of these larger buildings. So they're usually pretty, pretty wealthy people. Um, usually older uh mm -hmm. as well um and then the other channel is single family and and we're we're looking for distress you know so uh so the single family owners they could be anyone who's in foreclosure they have a municipal lien on the property they have uh ongoing uh tenant disputes and evictions mm -hmm. um they could be in probate um so yeah i mean i mean you Tax tax delinquent. I mean, you just name name any kind of distress, and I know how to look it up. All right. Yeah, that's great. And uh, what what is your buying strategy? Like, uh, if someone, let's say, the market value after repair is uh, ballpark number five hundred k, right? A repair cost is hundred k. So based on you know uh, these numbers, what would be your asking? Uh, asking price. Yeah. To my purchase price. Purchase price. So yeah, it's, I would say, you know, and I, being an engineer, you know, I used to need to really go back and do all my spreadsheets before I can make an offer, but I I've just gotten a lot more comfortable to just back of the napkin or like on my phone, just, mm -hmm. so I, I, I just do the, uh, 70% roll. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it would just be, uh, the ARV uh, times 70% minus uh, rental cost. Rent cost. So 500,000 times 70% would be 350 yep. minus, minus 100. Um, 
which would be two two fifty. So, yeah. Yep. yeah I, no, I I would say on a... everyone used the same kind of rule, right? Yeah. Most of the most of the investors they use the similar rule. That it my... depends on the market situation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's what I was going to say. And yeah. in my market, especially if it's a multifamily um, that we intend to 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 hold long term, we we do want to use use the burr method and t- and pull out most of our cash. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what I found is to be comp- like even a little bit competitive um, with what other people are paying, uh, we need to we need to be more like eighty or eighty five percent. So if it's like a four unit or a, or a five unit, like I mean, really, I'm like if I can pull most of my money out, you know, um, and be left with twenty or thirty or forty k in in a, in a five hundred thousand dollar deal, I mean that's that's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. So as long as uh, the property is a positive cash flowing mm-hmm. and only little is left after the burr method, uh, that that should be a good deal. Right, and and we're you know we're making good cash flow off of our current rentals, so we use that to replenish our capital, and then we mm-hmm. do flips, you know. So to we use our flip money to replenish our our capital as well capital, so, yeah and um you know with regards to financing right uh do you use your own cash or do you use hard money lender bank loans how do you guys work man we've done everything so um uh you know being being an engineer i started out i was very fortunate to start out with a significant amount of my own money um unfortunately that got tied up pretty quickly yeah. um <laughs> And, uh, so, um, then I moved into, you know, I I've, I've gotten HELOCs on my primary residence. I've gotten HELOCs on rental properties. Um, so home equity line of line of credit. Um, and then, uh, I would say like the, the bread and butter for the past couple of years have, has been, has been private money. Um, we usually use private money for flips. Um, but, Private money is just uh, people that I know, you know, either friends and family, but then I've I've also just met other local investors who are older and just don't, they, they have a lot of money at this point um, and they don't want to do as much work. Um, so they'll just lend me money, you know, on each project. So if I'm buying a $150,000 flip, they'll lend me $150,000 and I'll say, hey, we'll put in you know, we'll put our own capital into the uh, rehab. So you just lend me $150,000 for the purchase. We'll put 50 into the, to the rehab. We'll sell it for 300 and they'll make 12% on, on, on their money. So um, that's been, that's been working yeah, so out that, really well. That's a fixed percentage, not a share profit sharing basis. That is not profit sharing. That is, it's, okay. it's a, it's a loan. It's a loan. Okay. Yeah. All right, sounds good, man. Um, and maybe let, now let let's talk about some of the uh, good and bad deals that you have encountered uh, till now. So if you can just say we, we, what was the what was the worst deal that you came across, and uh, you know how did you try? What did you do to fix it? I would say. Yeah. Um, worst deal. Uh, I guess I won't talk about a flip. Um, we had one flip that we lost money on, but, uh, so, which was also a very old property. Um, so, but worst buy and hold is, uh, was a three unit that, um, we bought for 64,000, um, which I know I live in a cheap market, but even in my cheap market, that's really, really cheap. Um, 64 is uh very good <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, it's in a really good location too uh-huh. so um we bought it for sixty four thousand. we bought it uh right like in the middle of when covid was hitting so um i think it was i think we closed in may of 2020 mm-hmm. um so first of all that was that was uh, like a three-month period where um pri- my, all my private lenders did not want to lend because no one knew what was going to happen no one knew that real estate was about to go bonkers mm-hmm. um so uh I, I couldn't get private money so i actually had to go with hard money 
Um, and so it was worse terms, uh, less flexible terms. And we had to um, pay interest on the renovations uh, even before we got the renovation draw money. Um, and we were planning on putting in, I want to say 150. Mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty heavy. Um, buy for 64, put in 150. And I, I think at the time we were estimating ARV would be like 280. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe close, closer to 300. But so anyways, so number one, the financing was not ideal. Um, uh, number two, uh, we started working and got like a, like a stop work notice right away. Um, you know, and we, we didn't know that we couldn't put on a roof. Uh, we needed a, permit. A, we needed a permit for a roof. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, in, in my area, most, uh, municipalities, you don't need a permit to put on, put on a new roof, but this one you did, um, so we had to stop work. We had to get our permit. And then the permit application process, because it was COVID, it was like all. Yeah, it takes a while. Mucked up and they didn't yeah. know, you know, it was like, it was like, well, yeah, we're, you know, they needed to walk through it in person. And they, they were like, well, we're not doing in-person walkthroughs anymore. You know, so it was like, it was like, well, how do we get our permit? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that process really slowed us down. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we were starting, stopping, starting, stopping, starting, stopping. It ended up taking us two years. We found a major foundation issue that had to be addressed. Um, and meanwhile, in that two years, material costs is skyrocketing. Labor costs are skyrocketing. Luckily, real estate prices also went up. Um, so uh, by the end of the deal, we I think it appraised for $350. So it was higher than what we thought, but it was two years later. Um, yeah. And uh, our our renovations was over three hundred thousand. So three hundred that it, it doubled what we thought we would put into it. So right. it was a combination of unknowns and the cost, the cost going up, you know, and all the starting and stopping, you know. So it was just uh, it was a nightmare of a project. We refied we st we're still holding on to it um you know but uh i think we learned a lot of lessons there yeah it, it's a holding period that kills right uh you know on, because of the interest rate everything uh right. just uh, starts building up uh in addition to the cost of, of course you mentioned right you you never know what you'll uncover after you buy an old property uh right. sometimes foundation issues you never know yep Oh, all right. So as long as you came out, you know, uh, now it's uh, off the plate and you can focus on the other stuff. <laughs> it's it it's off our plate. You know, we kind of dug ourselves a hole. We did a lot of successful flips in that time, too. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, like I was talking about, you know, we we need to do that right now in order to, you know, I view the the money is. It like um or the the cash flow is like building a big bonfire, and you you got to keep feeding the fire, um, yeah. and then it'll it'll give off heat, you know. But um, at this point, you know, we need to keep feeding that fire and building it bigger and bigger, so we can keep building our cash flow. So what what is your uh, uh how how do you see yourself in future? Like what is your next strategies? Just uh, keep focusing on the flicks and flips, buy and hold, or are you planning to venture out into uh, commercial, uh, multifamily, like large multifamily, I would say. Yeah. Uh, any any such plans? So I would love to co to continue buying with my partner. Um, I I personally want to buy bigger properties because I've seen you know even going from like a single family to a four unit or a five unit. Um, I've seen how much you know those bigger properties can scale. Um, yeah. and you know, I'm comfortable with commercial lending. I'm comfortable with larger amounts of money. My partner has 15 guys. Uh, you know, he's building out his construction and also his property management. So mm -hmm. I think operationally we're set up to be able to buy some larger properties. Um, it's just tough to find them in my, in my market. So, but I, I would say, um, you know, if I could buy, you know, a couple larger 
20 to 30 unit buildings, um, you know, we'd pretty much be done um, as far as building our own, you know, buy and hold portfolio. Now in the future, what I, what I would like to do personally is I, I'd like to have half of my income come from my own properties and then half of my income come from other investments. Um, specifically what I'm trying to do personally is invest as an LP into other people's uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'd be happy to do that locally mm -hmm. myself, but I, I view that as part as diversifying, um, you know, and then also, uh, I'm, I'm passive in those, in those projects. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, and then it, it gives me an opportunity to invest in other parts of the country. I mean, I, I love my local market. It's great. Um, yeah. you know, but I, I would rather not have a hundred percent of my assets tied up in central Pennsylvania. I would love to yeah. get exposure into, into other markets. Well, that, that, that's a great strategy. You know, and that's what we have been doing also, uh, our active, you know, Active income is mainly into the ground up construction for the luxury single family houses, as well as we build, you know, uh, small multifamily units, uh, anything below 20, around 20, 20, 25 units, I would say. Uh, Love it. And uh, um, I, we started diversifying into larger multifamilies. Uh, uh, you know, I started investing as an LP uh, back in uh, 2018. And... Uh, Based on what we learned, you know, now uh, we provide uh, opportunities for the investor if they want to participate in the active deals, you know, of uh, fast uh, closure, right. like within one or two years, you, you can rotate your money in the active construction projects. If they are willing to, you know, just uh, invest uh, for the long term, five years, six years, whole period, and uh, they are only interested in a steady cash flow, monthly or quarterly cash flow then they have the options to invest in the large multifamily syndications that we do. Awesome. And um, yeah, so uh, plays out both the ways, you know, we get a passive income from that side actively, uh, uh, you know, in that kind of new construction projects. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. All right. Great. All right, uh, Kyle. Uh, uh, so let's move on to the final round of our show. Uh, just some basic, simple questions. Uh, you know, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, man. Uh, so the first one is, what is the book that you recommend? The one which has, uh, you know, uh, uh, which has changed or had a very positive effect on your life, career, or your business? Okay, so uh, I hate to just say what everybody says, but uh, I'm just going to have to go with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, the Purple Bible, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Purple Bible, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's one of the basic book, right? Uh, every every investor, real estate, they should read, regardless of real estate or not. I would say it's it's a good book book to read. I actually read that after I bought my first property, though. Like it yeah. it was it was starting to click before I read it. You know. Yeah. So <laughs> then I th then I read it. Um, I also read. I'll give you another one since that's a really easy answer. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what it's called. I, it's, I think it's called like tax, tax free wealth. So it's like a, in the, in the rich dad, uh, series, mm -hmm. Tom, Tom wheelwright, I think. Okay. Um, and then uh, that's where I learned about depreciation and 1031 exchanges and, and all that fun stuff. Um, and after I read that, that's when I was like, this is what I, this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, that's great. All right. Um, so, what is, what is the uh, best business or investment advice that you will like to give to our listeners? Um, I would say, uh, I would say be. I would say do do a lot of research, um, learn but you need to be aware of when you're getting to the point where you've learned enough and you need to just take action. Um, you're never going to learn everything uh, mm -hmm. be before you take action. So, you know, maybe you get to the point where you feel like, ah, I've, 
listened to like a hundred podcasts and I've heard a lot of the same things over and over again. Like, you know, at that point, you know, it's time to just jump in and just start doing deals. Um, and you're going to learn so much more just by doing deals. And then the other, the other thing, you know, and this is kind of like part two of that advice, the more deals that you do, the more deals you're going to get deals learn to lead, lead to more deals. And then you, and then you, you meet people and you grow, you grow your network. So, um, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why I do so much, why I'm doing buy and hold and flipping and wholesaling. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a realtor, you know, I want to involve myself in as many transactions as possible, um, yep. and be interacting and doing deals with all kinds of people within real estate, um, just to become known and just have, you know, just to be putting out my brand and showing them, showing them what I'm doing, showing them yeah. that I'm, I'm a good person to work with. Um, so I mean, yeah, that's, building the network, right. Building yeah. the network. Yeah. So uh, that's the main thing. And, uh, as you said, right. Uh, don't, uh, don't just wait, uh, for everything to be like hundred percent perfect. You right. will, yeah. There is no perfection. There is nothing like hundred percent. For I'm, I'm hundred percent ready now. Let's invest. No, right. just learn, learn the basic things, um, and get started. You know, even Don't. if you want to get started with a small amount or you know with a smaller, or maybe partner with someone. I would say, you know, right. who really knows the business. Don't let perfect get in the way of better. Yep, exactly. That's a that's the right way to say. Yep. All right. Uh, so Kyle, uh, final question. Uh, how can Decoding Cashflow listeners get in touch with you? Uh, so I have a website. It's called realliferentals.com. Um, so I started doing the website uh, probably five or six years ago now. Um, but I basically, I track my monthly income. So I show how the portfolio has grown. Uh, I show, you know, all the all the highs and lows of owning, owning property. Um, you know, and, and you can see, you know, way back when I got started and I was, I got excited when I made like $500 a month. Um, and you know, now it's a much larger operation. So there's 54 units right now in the, in the portfolio. So, um, that's also really cool. If you're, you know, like us, you have a background in engineering, or if you're, you know, analytical based, uh, you know, those types of people like that. Um, so, Website, realliferentals.com. Um, the only uh, kind of social media that I'm pretty active on is Twitter, um, but I, I try to post uh, daily and I'm just posting um, stuff that I'm doing, uh, projects that I'm working on, pictures, uh, and just general real estate advice. It sounds great, Kyle. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thanks a lot, Ted. Thanks for listening to Decoding Cashflow, brought to you by Aster Capital. If you found value in this episode, then please share it with someone who you think could benefit from it and make sure to act on what you've learned. If you want Ted Patel to personally help you reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with him. Also, visit us at astercapital.com for more free resources. Content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. As always, please consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions or setting a course of action. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Decoding Cashflow, and we'll catch you in the next episode.